Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, we are going to make. Meine Damen und Herren, ich würde sagen, wir beginnen dann mit der heutigen Nachmittagssitzung. Ich möchte dazu noch sagen, dass ich davon ausgehe. Way, but because as you will have noticed, there is a plenary session of the Parliament taking place, and unfortunately, this room is almost as it were above the plenary chamber. It makes it difficult to get people through from the entrance. So, having said that, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the ALDI group, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, here in the European Parliament, to welcome you on my behalf and also on behalf of my other ALDI colleague, colleague Gessin Meissner. Uh, we decided together to host this conference on the 2020 gender perspective for the EU and Turkey. And obviously I'm glad that we have with us today uh, a number of distinguished guests, in particular our former ALDI colleague, uh, Karen Rees Jurgensen, who was instrumental in the conference we had last year on a similar topic and it was really because of the success of that conference uh, that we wanted to repeat the exercise this year. I'm sorry that Karen is no longer a member with us, but I'm delighted that she's here uh, today to, to see how we're pursuing uh, her work. So welcome and thank you, Karen. But of course, I'm likewise uh, delighted that we are again uh, running this event together with uh, Kagida and Tusiad, uh, Turkish organizations, that is uh, a huge privilege for us too. Now, perhaps to try to set the context of today's proceedings, we know that the EU has had um, a roadmap for gender equality, which has run from the year 2000 to 2010. And it's clear that as policymakers in the Commission uh, and here in the Parliament, as we now move forward, we need to continue to take account of issues uh, regarding gender equality, the employment of women, uh, parental leave, uh, how the economic and financial crisis uh, impacts particularly on family and women, um, to see how the programs, the EU programs like Daphne have, have worked, um, the whole issue of violence against women, which has of course uh, been a priority of the Spanish presidency. But we also have to ask ourselves the question, do we need another roadmap to follow on, or should perhaps this whole issue be an integral part of the so-called 2020 economic strategy uh, for the European Union? And how within that do we relate the issue, as it were, of East and West uh, and the comparison between European Union and Turkey? And can actually that comparison, looking at what happens within the Union and within Turkey, can that comparison of gender issues assist us in many of the difficult and sensitive questions uh, that we have to deal with, to do with the accession process, to do with enlargement of the Union in general? Now, of course, I approach it from the sort of basis and the ALDI group approaches it very much from the basis that we are very, very positive uh, to Turkish accession to the European Union. Uh, and some of you may know that when our sort of political family met in Barcelona uh, last autumn, it was an important uh, thing for us that we had a resolution that welcomed the steps that Turkey was making uh, towards accession, uh, welcoming it Obviously, some concerns about freedom of expression and the media, and also seeing that there are issues still to do with gender equality. It remains a challenge for Turkey. It also remains a challenge for us uh, in the European uh, Union, especially when we think of issues 
like how the labour market is structured to do with pay, equal pay and the huge gap that still exists and also particularly to do with participation in political life. Now, I was very pleased uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a visit here uh, in the parliament um, from Mrs. Gudal Askit, who is the chairwoman of the um, Equality Committee in the Turkish parliament. She brought with her a cross-party uh, group of Turkish parliamentarians. And it was quite um, interesting sitting, uh, talking to them that in a certain way, the problems and the challenges uh, that we face are really in many ways uh, no different. Many of them are quite uh, similar. For instance, when we look at the participation of women uh, in political life and in positions of responsibility, um, as I understand the figures in, I think, 2007, the elections in Turkey, the percentage of women in the parliament went up from 4% to 9% or just above. Um, I could also share with you that in the United Kingdom, um, between 92 and 97 elections, we went from 9% to 20%. And tomorrow, when we have elections in the United Kingdom for a new parliament, I doubt we will get beyond 25%. So that's why I say we have similar problems. None of us um, are immune. Even the so-called mother of parliaments in London uh, doesn't make a very good impression uh, when it comes to uh, gender equality. So we have things in similar uh, and maybe we can learn from comparisons and learn uh, from uh, our experience. And likewise, I think it was interesting um, last autumn here in Brussels in the European Union itself. Some of you will know, and I think we uh, mentioned it indeed uh, when we had the event last year, that of course we all knew there were going to be four top posts in the EU, the President of the Council, President of the Parliament, the High Representative uh, and the President of the Commission. And of course out of those four posts, ultimately one was a woman. But you know it took a number of our colleagues from the Parliament, we actually put on ties and brandished documents saying CV and marched down to the council the day before the final decision. And there was no doubt, I think, that our sort of uh, personal demonstration assisted in Mrs. Ashton's appointment. Um, so sometimes direct action is necessary. Um, but one out of three is not good enough. But I think it's also uh, telling uh, that Mrs. Ashton has not had an easy ride, but I also think it's marvelous that we now do have a woman dealing with foreign affairs for the European Union. And if you hear her talking about things like the um, earthquake, it's a different tone to that that we're normally used to. And how many foreign ministers who are women are there in the European Union countries? Just one. So she looks different, she sounds different, uh, and that's good. But still a lot of progress to be made. And then, of course, as I said, we want to think about the EU 2020 strategy. A strategy that is set out by the Commission um, as an economic strategy to how we make the internal market really work better and unblock some of the roadblocks to making Europe flourish economically. And that's as important for the EU as it is for Turkey as a special partner and hopefully ultimately a member of the EU. But it's very interesting in that 2020 strategy document if you look at it, there is not one mention currently of gender issues. And how are you going to make Europe's economy successful if you don't uh, involve 
and underline some of those issues about the full participation of women in the marketplace, in the workplace, uh, and in the decision-making uh, process. So again, as I say, the EU is not always as good as it should be as these issues, and that's why I think that you can help us, we can help you, it should be a mutually beneficial uh, process. So that's the sort of background or ideas I want us to have in mind as we move forward with our presentations and our discussions this afternoon. Finally, just one uh, housekeeping issue. As we are going to be quite pressed for time, um, rather than having questions by way of people indicating they want to ask questions at the end of a presentation, uh, you've all been given sort of questionnaire sheets. Please fill them in. Uh, somebody will be circulating to collect them. And if we feel we can interpose questions, we will. But otherwise, we will try to use the period afterwards for cocktails and also to answer the questions afterwards, perhaps by email. I'm sorry for that, but we have to be relatively uh, fast in the way we move forward. If it does become possible uh, to take questions more, um, how can I say, spontaneously, we will. Uh, but let's see how we go. So that's enough from me. Welcome, and let's move on with our agenda and our speakers. Slightly different from what's published, but to reflect the participation of uh, TCAD with the conference, the first speaker to whom I will give the floor will be Mr. Zafar, Zafar Director General of TCAD. Dear colleagues, uh, dear guests, it has always been a great honor and pleasure for TCAD to be a partner in this annual conference organized by ALDE Group in association with Calder. The topic of the conference, Gender Equality in the EU 2020 Perspective, is at the core of TUSIAD's vision for Turkey. As the main representative organization of the Turkish business world and a member of Business Europe, the Confederation of European Business, TUSIAD is committed to promoting a Turkey that is more competitive globally and is a member of a more competitive European Union. We expect from the European Union to support entrepreneurship, innovation, and social development, sustainable growth, and therefore generate more and more jobs. This is why gender equality is a priority for us, not only as the fundamental value of our democracy, but also because the employment of women is a key driving force to reach the goals of the EU 2020 strategy. The membership process of Turkey to the EU has played an influential role and will continue to be a triggering factor in terms of women's rights in Turkey with the insistent efforts of NGOs, particularly the women's organizations. As the progress reports prepared by the European Commission address, gender equality remains a major challenge in Turkey, despite notable examples of high-level presence of women in the Turkish society. Rate of women's labor force participation, employment, and access to education are still among the lowest in the EU and in OECD countries. At the other end of the spectrum, women's participation in certain professions, as lawyers, as professors, as doctors, is relatively strong. The number of women in top management levels at multinational and national companies in Turkey is also worth mentioning. In Turkey, we need to have a comprehensive strategy to increase women's employment. I will not go into the detail in this issue since it is going to be handled by the presentation of Mrs. Nurger, the president of TUSIAD's Gender Equality Working Group. Distinguished guests, participation of women in political decision-making mechanism is one of the most crucial elements, not only for democracy and development, but also for its impact on decision-making at all levels, from the family, to the nation, to the international community. There is an ultimate need for women role models in positions of power and decision-making. 
After the last elections held in 2007, the proportion of women in the parliament has doubled to 9.1%. Although the current situation is definitely far from gender parity, it is a positive step forward. We know that temporary special measures like quota systems have been implemented by many countries. In Turkey, we, as representatives for NGOs, aim to continue our persistent efforts to bring these temporary measures to the agenda of the Turkish political parties. Although men continue to hold a monopoly over Turkish politics and are the majority in the labor force, women in Turkey are taking more and more important roles in economic and social life. This is very positive for social progress and sustainable economic welfare. Participation of women in politics, economy and social life is a crucial determinant of democracy and development level of any country. We know that main goals of the European Union are full employment, a high level of social protection, long-term economic growth, and sustainable development in a knowledge-based society. As there is progress in supporting active participation of women in the labor market and in, and in reducing gender gaps in different spheres of life, we believe that Turkey will contribute to social and economic welfare of the EU. As you see at, we published two reports in 2000 and 2008. The second one, which was prepared in collaboration with Kagider, included subjects related to EU framework and Turkey's candidacy from the standpoint of gender equality. We have also organized seminars both in Turkey and in Brussels in 2006. I believe these seminars provide a valuable platform to discuss the latest developments and exchange of views on the steps that should be taken towards gender equality. The distinguished speakers will tackle thoroughly all these issues. Thank you very much for your presence and contribution to this event today, and I wish you all a fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for your presence uh, and for your intervention. Although at some stage I shall be curious to know, and perhaps one of the speakers will address this, as to why you have such success in Turkey with lawyers and other professionals, uh, but not at other levels in, in seeing women get through. So if somebody can provide an answer to that, that would be good. But now, if I can introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alia Sivan from Kadiga. Thank you so much for being with us, the president of that organization. Thank the floor you. is yours. Dear distinguished members of the EU Parliament and dear guests, on behalf of Kagidar Women Entrepreneurs Association of Turkey, I would like to welcome you all to our conference. First of all, I would like to thank Aide and our partner Tusiad for organizing this conference. We are very pleased to be here. As Kagidar, we are committed to the membership of Turkey to the EU, and we believe that this process has been crucial in the development of women's rights in Turkey. However, gender equality and women's rights issues are major challenges for Turkey, as stated in the last progress reports. We are gathered here in this conference to discuss the challenges and the possible solutions to the question of gender equality, both in the EU and in Turkey, under the framework of 2020 strategy. With this strategy, we would like to see concrete steps taken and true commitment from the EU institutions and member states to strengthen the arguments and positions of women in different countries such as Turkey. True gender perspective is essential in order to encourage economic and social growth in the European Union. Steering ourselves out of the current crisis of which women have been long-term victims means recognizing their essential role in our societies. Women are key to Europe's recovery as they represent 52% of the EU population and more than 60% of the university graduates. The challenges we are facing in Turkey are mainly limited political commitment to work on gender issues, a dominant patriarchal and traditional mindset, and lack of gender mainstreaming tools. I would like to share, um, can you help me with the slide, please? 
Only 6 million out of 24 million uh, women at working ages are employed at the moment in Turkey. And the employment rate is has been decreasing in the last decade, um, in, uh, whereas the employment rate of women has been increasing in the EU countries. In Turkey, in the last decade, it has decreased from 30% to almost 23%. And uh, according to the employment rate targeted by the Lisbon strategy, we have to reach a uh, 60% 60 60 employment rate, which means another uh, jobs for 8 million more women. Evolving from this clear objective, we have launched six weeks ago a campaign to increase the employment rate of women in Turkey, which we renamed We Want a Job. Our main mission with this campaign is to create awareness among politicians, employers, women, civil society organizations, and media, and to push them towards making necessary and taking necessary actions for increasing the women employment rate in Turkey. We had a very wide coverage on the TV channels, on the daily, and, uh, daily press and periodicals, and some of the radio stations which I think we will be sharing some of it. Um, the campaign targets three main groups, government politicians, private companies, and society women. I would like to show the next one. Yeah. The, these ads uh, were in the press, and this one targets the, uh, targets the, no, it's not correct, I'm sorry. This one targets the government, the politicians, and uh, we are asking for jobs to be created for 8 million more people. So in the text, we say that we are very behind the um, employment rate targeted by the Lisbon strategy, and that the women of Turkey are doing very poorly in comparison with the women of other countries. And so we are asking the politicians to take necessary measures and we remind them that we're going to ask them about what plans they have taken and what measures they have taken when elections come in 16 months in time. Child care, uh, the difficulties to reconcile work and family life primarily affect women since they carry most of the responsibility. Child care is a critical factor in eliminating barriers to women's participation in the labor market. At the moment, we started working on a development plan of care and support services together with the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. According to this plan, childcare expenses will be tax exempted for both the employer and the employee for an annual ceiling. The plan has three major impacts. If we can have it accepted, it will facilitate women's participation into the labor market. It will create new jobs, especially in the services. And also, it will turn some of the informal economy, which is mainly dominated by women, into formal activity. So we are expecting a lot of results from this plan if we can have it achieved. But we have very, the, the minister himself is quite interested in the subject. The other one, um, Yes, targets the private sector. As you know, in all the world, throughout the world, we are the ones who do most of the consumption. I mean, we decide what to buy in our households. But uh, when we come to working conditions, we don't see any gender equality considered in the private sector, or not as much as we would like it to be. So under this, um, we don't want them only to tell us about branding and what to consume, but we were going to check and evaluate how their corporate policies will be based on gender equality. And for this team, we're working together with the World Bank for a gender certificate. And private companies will go through an assessment if they want to, of course, we don't force them, based on certain criteria. And their corporate policies and practices with regards to gender equality will be evaluated. This will help us to see a clear picture of gender equality sensitivity of the Turkish private sector. <coughs> and for the women, we have a, sorry, one more. Okay. 
that's for the society, <laughs> because in the traditional mindset, we are really responsible for giving birth and for being moms, which we very much enjoy being so, but we know that we're good enough for doing other things, and we want our share in the society as we represent 50% of the population. And under this chapter, we started a project called Learning My Rights. As you know, a lot of new legislation has been done uh, in favor of women in Turkey, thanks to the membership process uh, to the EU, but there's a big gap between law and practice. So our project covers visits, meetings, and workshops with different women of different cities in Turkey, and the discussions will be based on the new legislation, creating awareness of the changes, and show the means of implementing them and make them a part of our lives. And it seems to be a quite difficult job, but we're going to start the first visit this month in Gaziantep. So, dear participants, we are very glad to develop an overall understanding of active citizenship all together as women of Europe, and we believe that the struggle against the dominant mentality will be more important than ever in the EU and the world in the coming decades. Wishing for an effective and interesting debate, I hereby would like to thank speakers for their contribution and Aylde and Tusiad for the organization of this event. Thank you. Seeing your advertising campaign and the slogans, I don't think some of those would go amiss in the European Union <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, trying to uh, achieve the uh, 2020 uh, vision. Thank you. But thank you very much. Um, and our next speaker uh, is Nicola Harrington, Director General of the UN, UNDP office uh, here in Brussels. Um, Welcome. I think you're going to deal with uh, gender from a more international perspective, and um, particularly following on from the Millennium Development Goals. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you to the LD Group and the organisers for what I think is an incredibly timely debate. And uh, in looking at the issues of uh, international processes, uh, your meeting falls actually between two quite landmark points. One being the 15-year uh, review of the Beijing Declaration um, and Platform for Action that took place in March this year, um, and basically reviewed the actions that were agreed at the Fourth Conference of Women in 1995 in Beijing. And um, in September this year, we will have the 10-year review of the Millennium Development Goals. And I think that all of these issues uh, really kind of fit very uh, firmly in both of those processes. Uh, just a reminder, there are two specific uh, gender um, MDGs. The MDG 3, Millennium Development Goal 3, about tackling gender disparity in education, that has as one of its indicators precisely the share of women in wage employment beyond agriculture, but also has another one, and the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments. And it has that uh, second indicator, not only because of the importance of women being visible in those um, forums, but also in this notion that where women have a participation, that will change the nature of the debate, which I think is precisely the point, uh, the Madam Chair, that you were raising um, at the beginning. The other uh, Millennium Development Goal 5 is about reducing by three quarters maternal mortality by 2015. And I will uh, talk about that later, but I think it's really quite telling that that is the goal of the eight goals that exist that is the one with the slowest rate of progress, uh, even though um, there are entirely clear um, uh, evidence in terms of what actions need to be taken. Um, I think the close link between both the Beijing Platform for Action and the MDGs is twofold. One, that gender empowerment has an intrinsic value in its own right, but also that sustainable routes out of poverty really depend and require upon women being both beneficiaries of processes in the economic and society, but also um, contributors to those processes. Uh, the 15 years since Beijing review in uh, March, I think pointed to a number of areas of progress globally, um, but it also pointed to something which is very clear that progress is slow, slower than was anticipated, and is extremely uneven. If you look in gender parity in education, it is clearly improving, but it's improving less beyond primary education. It's in, improving less when you look at attainment and the results, if you like, of people having gone to school. 
And worryingly, there are quite clearly widening gaps between those who do have access and those who don't. I said about the uh, very poor progress on maternal mortality, and it's a, it's a well-known statistic, but a really horrific one when you think that somewhere in the world, a woman is dying every single minute from compli complications related to either childbirth or pregnancy. Really very dramatic um, statistic, I think. Um, the, my colleagues have already spoken to this notion about more women being uh, in the workforce than ever, but it is also the case, of course, that globally, many are in poorly paid jobs, with fewer rights than men, potentially less protection, and with clear gender ja gaps in wages, job stability, access to social protection. And all of those elements are fundamental to the decent work agenda, uh, which is included in the Millennium Development Goals, and the European Union has been such a champion of, both within the EU and also internationally. And of course, more women than ever are holding political office, over 40% in Rwanda, but a lot less in a number of other countries. And it's quite interesting when UNDP, which is looking at its Human Development Index, is now looking at a gender index specifically. Rwanda is up there in the top 10, but there's an awful lot of countries that you would have thought should have been somewhere in there and that are not. Um, and the global average of 18.6% uh, of parliamentarians being women is very far from that 30% target that was set in Beijing. At the current pace of change, we estimate it would take us until 2045 to reach that international target. That's a heck of a long time to wait for uh, better quality decision making and better participation. I think two blocks of issues as well, just to kind of put on the table, and again, they were raised by the chair in the opening. Um, they've become much more visible on the international agenda since the Beijing Platform of Action. One is the whole of the issue of gender-based violence. Um, I think it's been now a state of priority of the globe, at a global level, a regional level, a national level, ever since some landmark uh, resolutions within the Security Council 10 years ago. And yet, despite the political profi profile on the issue, we all know that violence against women persists in all countries, all regions, in peacetime and in conflict, and with quite devastating consequences on individuals as well as communities. And I think it's interesting when you make the economic linkages, because somehow economic linkages tend to resonate more than what it means to the individual, which is in itself sometimes worrying. Uh, but the studies show that violence can result in a loss of household income equivalent to 25 to 30% in poor, in poor households. So I think this kind of knock-on effect and this notion that you cannot look in, in gender empowerment purely as an, a woman's issue, but really as this broader economic and society issue is very well demonstrated, I think, by that, um, by that statistic. Uh, quite clearly, the international community is only at the beginning of what must be done. Uh, if you take specifically the issue of Security Council resolutions about involving women in decision-making on peace processes, uh, UN research shows that in 10 of the major recent peace processes, women still only constituted 6% of the negotiators and 3% of the signatories. Yet clearly women, given a fair chance, do act as tremendous agents of change and are tremendous forces for peace and sustainable peace. The second issue that quite clearly has come much more to the fore in both the uh, Beijing platform of action and also the MDGs is this issue of the crisis. But while as for Europe, the crisis is essentially seen, I think, still around the global economic downturn, uh, for a lot of developing countries, they're also suffering from impacts today of climate change. Climate change adaptation is a real issue for a lot of developing countries at this moment in time already. And they're also uh, still suffering from the lingering effects of high food prices and high fuel prices that were in the news a year and a half ago, and the consequences are still being fed, uh, felt, but somehow have gone off the international agenda in terms of being a matter of concern. And both of these elements, I think, are really challenging the progress which has been, been made in poverty. But if you take the issue of the global economic crisis, men and women have lost their jobs. Um, in fact, more, women, uh, may, more men may have become, become unemployed um, as a result of the crisis, and yet the evidence shows that unemployment amongst women is more persistent. Once they're out of a job, it's harder for them to get back into a job. Again, these kind of linkages between what this can mean. In a recent survey in the United States of domestic violence shelters, they saw that the, um, there was an increase in women seeking help from, abu for ab from abuse as of September 2008. September 2008 was precisely, if you remember, really one of the, when the, the, the heart of the economic downturn really started to be felt in the US. 
if you look at the issue of climate change, 60% of women are looking at and depending on their lives, their livelihoods and feeding their children from the natural environment that is around them. So it is quite clear that women's voices need to be heard on these range of issues which are challenging the world, the world internationally. I think some of the statistics leave us with a lot of questions internationally. Uh, despite Beijing, despite the, despite the political attention, uh, it does seem that exclusion of women in much of global decision making, national decision making, even household decision making, seems to be the exception rather than the rule. What does that terrible lack of progress on maternal, on maternal mortality prevention say about the priority that has been given to financing women's needs? What do the unequal consequences of today's economic crisis tell us about upholding international norms and standards, including the decent work agenda of the ILO? And I think what I was very struck by in terms of in the Beijing Plus 15 was it was this very point in terms of how important to share the lessons and share the practices and see what can be done together. And I take very much this point of um, that it's quite clear that the lessons of what has worked can be spread in an, in an awful large range of countries. I do not think there is countries who can teach and countries who can learn. I think it's much more dispersed from that. Um, we were looking specifically in the issue of women's political participation, and I hesitate to hold forth on a region that I know much less about than all of the people sitting on the panel with me. But we looked um, in terms of women's uh, participation in Eastern Europe and the CIS countries, and it was really very interesting just the range of tactics and the range of strategies and the range of actions that people have used to overcome the institutional obstacles of participation. They arrange to addressing party political cultures, voter education, media awareness, training of female candidates, but also building cross-party caucuses, partnerships between governments and legislatures, the role of international women's movements in supporting national women's movements. And I think, if I'm correct, that the European Parliament has actually been looking at a number of these same issues itself in terms of, of after the European elections last year. First, I'd like to end just on uh, what Europe can do because I think it's quite clear that there are things, uh, and a lot of things that Europe can do. And I would say there were three areas of action that it would really be worth trying to reflect upon in this group. One is at the level of EU. One is at the level internationally. And the third one is really going back to this point of, I think, the, the case of uh, walking in front of the council and what, how actual individual action and individual organizations action really clearly matters. And I think in EU policy making, we would say that really um, one of the key lessons from the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action is that the role of the enabling environment in promoting gender equity is everything. There is virtually no policy within the European Union, internal or external action, that cannot have a gender dimension. It's just impossible to think of that. Um, and that's important to bear in mind because it is not always assumed. And uh, in fact, actually, that when the United Nations in Brussels responded to the public consultation around the EU 2020 strategy, it made just this same point, that there is no area in any of the strategy that you can really say there is not that gender dimension there, and yet it does clearly need to be articulated and understood. And I think linked to the EU 2020 strategy, Europe really has an opportunity, I think, in the way that it chooses to rebuild its regional, national, and its contribution to the international economy. There are ways of building it which do make it more inclusive. There are ways of recognizing that the, there will be different impacts on men and women. There are ways of linking economic and social policies more closely, and ways of tackling uh, women's legal empowerment, access to funding, training, and technology. So I think that the EU 2020 is a huge opportunity in relation to that should be seized, but also there are many other areas of EU policy making that I would encourage the Parliament to really uh, look at very closely from a gender perspective. The second element um, is that the, the UN really needs a strong EU voice. It really, really does need the voice that Europe has always had in terms of showing the way and leading the way internationally. And it needs it more than ever at this moment in time. And our only concern um, in your world post-Lisbon is that at a time that the EU that the UN really needs the EU, is it going to be in internally looking or will it continue to keep that face to the outside? And when there is the MDG review in September uh, of this year, Europe really needs to go to New York with new policy offerings. It needs to go with messages that the Millennium Development Goals are possible. It needs to go with messages of these are tried and tested actions that we know can help progress. 
and who knows, it could go with a very strong message of saying that actually one of the best investments in really making a breakthrough on MDG achievement is investing in women and girls and what can be done specifically in that. I would also um, hesitate to foray into an area that is, again, uh, as risky as me talking about a region that I do not know as well as all of you, in terms of just the huge array of instruments that a post-Lisbon EU has. And if you really do map strategically the range of instruments that between the EU institutions and the member states that you have, it is phenomenal. You can engage intergovernmentally in setting standards. You can engage within the EU in terms of leading the way on implementation of those. But you can also, very importantly, help other countries to meet their obligations by helping them build the capacities and deliver on those standards in their own way. And those of you from civil society, I think you have a huge responsibility in that, a huge responsibility in holding governments accountable. I think this point about people knowing what was actually signed up to internationally is a very fundamental point of the accountability. My last point is about you as parliamentarians and members of civil society and, and really encouraging you to share your knowledge. Um, in three years ago, in the International Women's Day in this parliament, um, together we launched I Know Politics, which is an international network, knowledge network of women in politics. And in the last three years, we've seen this huge take up. It's actually a virtual way of being able to engage around resources, around uh, lessons, around questions, around challenges. And if you take just one uh, case of um, somebody sitting in Turkey, a political strategist who used the connections out of I, I Know Politics to assist women who were interested in running for office throughout the region of Eastern Europe. And there's YouTube um, uh, testimonials of leaders from a range of countries to say what was their story, how did they get there, what did they learn on the way. And it is all, again, this notion of really trying to be out there as a resource to encourage that broader participation, but also to really support people in their, in their path on that. So I'd invite all of you who are not already engaged in the I Know Politics community to really come on board with us within that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, you raise really so many issues, and, and, and thank you for making the very clear link, linkage uh, between the, the economic and the gender agenda, agenda, if I can put it that way, because um, you made it very clear that 2020 needs this input, and also that the, the financial uh, crisis, if we didn't know it, is having its, its knock-on effect, whether it be with uh, violence against women or, or, or whatever, and, and that's good that we we're brought back to, to keep that in mind. You also make very well the point that I think many of us in this parliament are very conscious of at the moment. We thought once we got the Lisbon Treaty, that was it. But now we have a new round of challenges to make sure in the coming months that Europe's voice is quickly effective in international fora. Uh, and that's something I think that many of us are, are committed to trying to ensure. What we cannot afford is a European uh, Union involved in an arm wrestle between the different institutions. Uh, we have to get our voice out there and be more effective because that was what Lisbon was meant to be all about. So thank you from the outside for reminding us uh, of that. And I think that's a, an appropriate moment then to uh, turn uh, to our last speaker in, in that, this section, uh, Renatus Mazeka, who is head of unit financial support, fundamental rights and citizenship from the European Commission. Um, welcome. I think you're going to tell us something about the lessons learned from the Daphne program. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Chairperson. Um, dear honorable members, dear guests, uh, I'm really very much pleased to speak in this important conference. I will try to cover gender issue from two perspectives. One is violence against women, and another, uh, how financial instruments, like specifically Daphne program, has contributed or is contributing in uh, reducing or eliminating violence against women in, in EU. Uh, I guess all of you would agree that violence against women is, and young girls in, is unacceptable uh, from fundamental rights and gender equality perspective. And it's not least because violence does violate a fundamental rights, right of each person to, the, for, to life, safety, 
dignity and physical and mental integrity. Despite of, of surveys uh, we do have, so far it's very difficult to, ex to establish which extent, to which extent women and, and young girls are suffering from violence. Uh, however, available statistics leaves no doubt that the violence against women is really a major challenge in, in Europe. When you put the numbers to this human suffering, the problem becomes much more tangible. And I guess it's also economical cost, which is what uh, Ms. Harrington talked about uh, before, uh, takes um, a huge part, costs for health care, for social services, police, criminal justice system, and labor market as well. And just one of UK examples I got here, uh, one of surveys on domestic violence revealed that in UK, uh, it is cost for society on a yearly basis, it's around 24 billion pounds per year. It's direct and indirect cost. So, and if you extrapolate those figures to you, it would be a huge, an enormous amount. Uh, but really what we can do uh, to prevent it happening and what European institutions, governments and um, civil society can do to protect uh, victims of violence, to prevent, prevent violence and to be sure that uh, perpetrator, per, per, per, per, perpetrators uh, got punished. Um, there is a growing consensus that the problem should be addressed in a holistic way. It means that it should be law enforcement, it should be legislation, it should be education, awareness raising, uh, actions, and all those actions should be taken on different levels in society, involve all the relevant agencies, um, and to target, to target all European citizens. I guess violence against women and, and young girls should be addressed as we do normally address heart attack. So it is sort of fast, effective and immediate action. And uh, that there should be all services involved, housing, um, child uh, protection institutions, police, judicial, who would in a sort of harmonized or concerted way would handle the issue. And because its consequences are severe, its physical and mental uh, illness of people or even a death, therefore I guess uh, we need to tackle this issue very seriously and also the cost of, of, of violence is, is enormous in monetary and non-monetary terms as well. So the list is long what needs to be done, but I guess it's, would not, I would not emphasize enough that we need to start from education, first of all. We need to start from changing behavior of people, changing attitudes in families, um, and also we need to work together at European level to, to, to have an exchange of best practices, to make uh, enough, uh, let's say, problem known to everyone. And I guess it's, that is going to help. And of course, Daphne program, it's one of financial instruments of the Commission of EU, um, it's, is addressing this issue. Since 99, when the Daphne has been established, it funded um, of around 500 projects, which were, um, in different dimensions is it's awareness raising, it's training of key professionals, studies, uh, and grassroots actions addressing violence against women. Um, also, we have conducted a number of studies which allowed us to understand the magnitude of the problem. And problem, it takes holistic approach. It uh, tackles violence from the angles of prevention, protection, support, and, and rehabilitation. Um, I guess um, illustrative examples of good Daphne projects has been distributed and they are provided to thematic booklets, which we uh, summarized as our 10 years experience. And I want to say that this Daphne program has been uh, instrumental 
uh, in the establishment of European networks of NGOs, especially uh, dealing um, with violence against women. One of them is very well known, WAVE Network, and it also includes some Turkish NGOs in this network, uh, which provide shelters in Turkey, counseling, crisis support, intervention, and legal assistance. Um, the whole policy of child rights, rights have been initiated with the Daphne. Uh, it became a kind of separated uh, policy area. Um, also, our projects have disclosed um, and revealed that the situation is quite grave in, in EU, and it increased awareness of politicians and institutions. And therefore, we're having a regular calls from, from Parliament, uh, from member states that more should be done at the EU level. And I guess those things have been heard. Uh, Council of Europe is uh, preparing a um, convention on combating violence against women. Um, there is a, also commitments of, of, of the new commission to approach this issue seriously and to tackle it. And um, also, if we see in the framework of Daphne, we have conducted some uh, Eurobarometer studies. One was in 99, another in 2010, where we can compare data on perception and awareness of violence. And the data revealed that it is dramatically increased awareness of people. And also, they do call for more involvement at EU level. I think that EU should contribute more in, in, in tackling this problem. Uh, now, in the third phase, let's say, of Daphne, it is now uh, third perspective of Daphne, Daphne financial perspective from, from 2007 to 2013, we do have around 117 million euros. It's not the biggest financial program, but I guess it's, it's quite significant. And we do finance uh, transnational projects uh, in form of action grants, and also we're giving uh, operating grants to non-governmental organizations supporting their annual activities. Um, and I just will give you one example. The deadline for, for the last call is tomorrow. And already by today, we're having uh, applications ratio would be one to seven, then we can finance. So the demand for funding on the EU level is really huge to, uh, to finance uh, transnational projects. Uh, it's also pleads for budgetary authority maybe to, to give more money in, in the future as the problem is so important. Of course, also commission is also trying to strengthen its policy response uh, by some following actions. We have uh, conducting a study on a possible harmonization of national legislation in member states uh, regarding the violence against women and children. And the second third study we're doing currently is on harmful traditional practices in EU, which is focuses on female genital mutilation, on the crimes, forced marriages, and all other aspects of, of uh, harmful traditional practices. Um, we will have results this year, and we will try to disseminate them and to present them uh, uh, to wide audience, and also to draw conclusions from them and to see what kind of actions are necessary uh, at EU level to eliminate, if possible, uh, female genital mutilation and all other uh, um, harmful traditional practices, and as much as possible to to reduce um, and to eradicate violence against women. Uh, as I said earlier, I think there is a real need, uh, and would be for European coordinated approach. Uh, currently, we're having a quite diverse. Uh, approaches in EU member states regarding uh, legislation, regarding actions which has been taken by member states to, uh, to fight this uh, phenomena. And I think there is, there is a need for more harmony among these approaches because we can learn from each other. We can 
complement each other. And uh, I guess we need to think about more, uh, more effective instruments, how we can, uh, how we can tackle this, this problem. And I guess with the increased resources of, of DAFNE program, and also with a strong EU policy response, um, I have really high hopes that we can, not maybe in immediate future, but in some years to come, we can really see results of our common efforts and to see that we are progressing very well in eliminating this, this I would say, shameful uh, phenomena in, in EU. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, I, I can't help but be struck by the figure of the cost that you gave, even for the UK, um, and then to juxtapose that with the only one in seven projects being able to be funded. Um, and that clearly shows a huge gap and a gap um, <laughs> to be, um, just a moment, <laughs> hang on there, that needs to be front loaded into the education <coughs> process because it's changing surely the view of women in society, empowering women so that they're not subject to violence and, and that's uh, certainly the way I would like to see things uh, move and where the, I'd like to see the emphasis uh, placed to prevent. Uh, obviously, we have to pick up the pieces, but we have to prevent. Uh, I think we now have a video, so it will be a case of music lights, and when the video has finished, you will have a different chair. Uh, but thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed the first session as much as I've enjoyed chairing it on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start, ladies and gentlemen, to this session on the Challenge 2020 for Civil Society. First of all, uh, we received some questions on the general session going on of the European Parliament. Of course, when we scheduled uh, this event, we didn't know that there will be a volcano affair in Iceland. Because of this, uh, there are lots of votes which are delayed and now uh, taking place in the general session of the European Parliament. Uh, this is why we received several excuses from some members of the Parliament who wanted to be here. But we are very delighted that uh, the all others are here. Uh, starting with uh, Ms. Meissner uh, from the ALDE group, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Ms. Meissner will uh, conclude this session, uh, which will be first of all uh, introduced by a set of uh, uh, very distinguished speakers who will share with us their uh, very valuable uh, experiences uh, in the field, uh, in the research uh, uh, on this issue. Uh, I will just start uh, to introduce them uh, from my left, uh, Tijan Mergen, uh, who is uh, Kagidar's executive committee member and also chief marketing officer of uh, the Dogan uh, Media Group. And then it, uh, she will be followed by Ms. Nu uh, Ger, uh, a prominent industrialist in Turkey uh, and also a member of TUSIAD and uh, uh, president of TUSIAD's uh, gender equality working group. And then uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Umuan Bardak, uh, from uh, labor, uh, it's a labor market expert in the European Training uh, Foundation in Torino, uh, uh, with uh, very impressive uh, work, uh, analytical work uh, uh, on the uh, on this issue. And then uh, Cecil uh, Grebeval from uh, the powerful European uh, uh, women's uh, lobby. Uh, she will uh, take the follow right after that. Uh, uh, and then we will, uh, after this debate, uh, we will finish with uh, uh, three uh, interventions, three statements uh, on behalf of the first of all, the Spanish presidency of the European Union, uh, Ms. Capotila, uh, Capotolino Diaz, uh, <laughs> right, uh, uh, coming uh, from uh, Madrid, Director General uh, of Equality and uh, Employment. Uh, and uh, we are likely to have also uh, from the cabinet of Commissioner uh, Vivian uh, Redding, a participant. Uh, she, oh, yes, you are here. Okay, sorry, I didn't see when you were. So, uh, welcome. Uh, we are not likely but we, uh, to hear, but we have you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, and then we will uh, finish with you, as I said. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in this first uh, 
round uh, of this debate, uh, we will uh, listen to the main views, essential points that uh, uh, the speakers will, would like to share with us. Uh, so uh, I'll start with uh, Tijan uh, Merger, please. The floor is yours. Sir. Thank you. Uh, very distinguished members of parliament and uh, dear guests, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tusiat and Alde to uh, create such an opportunity for us to share our uh, experiences here with you. Uh, I will uh, talk about a little bit the education problem in Turkey. Uh, unfortunately, still the education is one of the main issues. And if you look at the gender uh, pr perspective, uh, starting from the illiteracy till the higher education, the university education, uh, the ratios uh, between male and female are quite different. Uh, if you look at the overall uh, literacy, uh, still 7.7% uh, of uh, male population is illiterate. Uh, if you look at the women's side, it is 12.3%. Uh, uh, so uh, there is still a uh, far uh, big difference. And if you uh, look at the primary education, primary education, uh, the beginning, the related ages is quite well, 98%, uh, 97% is going to school at the beginning, but the breaking point comes at the fifth grade. Uh, primary school is eight years and it is mandatory, but uh, still uh, there are some problems and very basic problems that uh, especially the girls cannot continue uh, and complete the primary school. Uh, for the five, first five years, there are schools in the villages, uh, even one classroom, three classrooms, and one teacher or two teachers, and they can still uh, conduct a training uh, till fifth grade. Uh, they call it as integrated uh, education system. First uh, grade and the second grade may uh, uh, share the same teacher and share the same classroom. But when you come to the sixth grade, then the science, social science, uh, literature starts. And then at uh, that point, uh, you need more classrooms and more teachers. And unfortunately, there is no schools, still the basic, the buildings in the villages. So uh, parents should send the children, their kids, uh, to the cities or towns. And there, uh, they prefer to send the boys, but not the girls. So if you look at the... Uh, graduation from the primary school rates, it becomes 85%. And out of this 15%, uh, each seven out of 10 uh, is girls. So usually girls stop uh, their education. So that's why uh, as Doğan Group, as Milliet, we decided to uh, make a big campaign uh, to really encourage uh, especially girls making the positive discrimination uh, to continue their educations and the main idea was to build dormitories uh, at the towns where the uh, schools uh, located so um, the, uh, our campaign, we call it as the uh, national movement, in fact, it's far behind the campaign, uh, called Daddy Send Me to School. We picked the uh, fathers uh, because uh, they really play an important role. And we, I think that that worked very well uh, during the um, whole campaign's uh, period. We started at uh, 2005, so it's the fifth year now. Uh, and we targeted three, three aspects. The first one was financial aid. The second one was to improve the, the social life of the girls. And the third one was enhancing uh, and uh, increasing the awareness of the problem, on the problem. And for the financial aid, we uh, decided to uh, build the dormitories in the uh, required areas and classrooms, still sc schools in the towns and the cities and the villages, and also uh, raise funding for scholarship for the girls. And uh, the second one was improving the quality of the social life. Uh, these poor girls, uh, they know their own villages and their uh, towns only. So 
in addition to the normal education that is provided by the Ministry of Education, we try to uh, teach them a little bit more si uh, arts or music or sports. So we try to uh, build some uh, sports salons uh, across uh, near to the dormitories or uh, to uh, decorate or uh, build some uh, social rooms uh, in the dormitories so that they can play guitar and get some uh, music lessons. And also we organize some seminars uh, for hygiene issues or uh, to give some uh, guidance to them for their career plannings uh, to prepare them for university education. And also uh, the awareness was quite important uh, to teach uh, fathers and mothers uh, why their uh, girls should go to school, their children go, should go to school. And also uh, announcing or promoting some uh, role models, best practices to, to uh, guide these uh, young kids. How we, will, how we have done it, and uh, we also continue to do it, we establish a steering committee uh, from different disciplines. Uh, we, have law, we have lawyers, we have um, uh, journalists, and also marketing people and financial people to cover all aspects of uh, the requirements. We are not a uh, profit organization, non-profit organization, so we are a media group. So. Uh, our role is really be, to become an umbrella and to support uh, non-profit organizations, associations who uh, has the same mission with us. So what we did, we contacted uh, with various uh, non-profit organizations uh, and especially with Chada Sheşam, Çeye Dede, we really uh, built a very strategic partnership and uh, since five years it worked uh, very well. At the beginning, just before launch, launching the campaign, we uh, visited almost all areas, contacted with uh, almost all uh, municipalities and uh, local bodies, government bodies, and tried to really locate the uh, urgent needs. And we also uh, organized some panels and workshops with all these local authorities to really understand the requirements. And then we, we uh, allocate, we uh, in the, um, located 17 places where the dormitories is uh, really required urgently, and also 7,000 girls that needs a scholarship. And we announce it, and each and every week uh, on Tuesdays, we put a uh, map on the newspaper locating the um, places where these uh, dormitories needed and where the scholarships is needed. And we got really very, very good uh, feedback on that. And uh, when it is done, we make it uh, uh, green. If, if it is still a requirement, it's, it was red. So we really continuously uh, promote this uh, map and uh, get really very good uh, feedback on that. And it is now in the fifth year, uh, we have achieved 29 dormitories. Our target was 17 and uh, we have over achieved it. And then uh, we have touched at least 10,000 girls. Some of them are graduated and some of them still continuing. And some of them unfortunately left uh, the school and we try to really uh, find out the reasons very well. Uh, at the end, we provided four years of scholarship, not just one year, in order to be sure that they complete at least their primary school or the secondary school education. Uh, we did lots of TV campaigns uh, uh, and some um, uh, sales exhibitions so that we can get money. And in the fifth year, we could, we could gather 34 million Turkish lira, which is approximately 17 million euro for the campaign. And maybe the best thing is uh, we could achieve 300,000 people, 300,000 individuals helped this campaign, either with one Turkish lira or one million Turkish lira in different uh, ranges, but 300,000 uh, people really uh, contributed in the campaign.
So I will not go to uh, other details. Maybe if there are questions, I can cover it uh, later. But uh, making uh, coordination with the Ministry of Education and the local bodies were quite important uh, to really understand the needs and get support, uh, especially. Baba uh, Beni. So each year we relaunched the campaign. Lütfen onu okula gönder. Uh, we Haydi used some Türkiye. testimonials uh, or some um, it says Haydi that uh, if you give just uh, 17 euro ma per month, you can uh, help uh, the education of one girl throughout the year. So this kind of campaigns we did a lot each and every year. We have lots of uh, awards. Uh, we are proud of it. And one of them was uh, from IPRA, uh, UN Special Award. Uh, we really are proud of it. And I really would like to finish my uh, presentation. Hasan. This ad, this is the current ads running Zeyda. on the TVs today in Turkey. Burda. The teacher Burda. is calling uh, children Burda. and the boys. I can say that they are there in the classroom, but the Burda. girls are somewhere Ayşe in the villages working. Fatma. And this poor girl is getting married at 13 years değil. of age. Okul. Baba beni okula gönder kampanyasına verdiğiniz destekle 5 yılda 10 bin kızımız okulda uh, oldu. Gelin, ayda sadece kırk liraya siz de bir kızımızın uh, eğitimine uh, destek verin. Ben uh, bir kızımızı daha okullarına gönderelim. And he did it for free of charge for us. So, thank you very much. Distinguished guests and parliamentarians and uh, uh, I would like to thank also Aldi for organizing today's uh, seminar and inviting us to share the common problems we have uh, as women, uh, contemporary women uh, of today. Uh, listening to the uh, first session, I understand uh, once more that uh, how common our problems are and how maybe the same solutions would be in certain cases whereby the campaign is very, very successfully reached uh, by our colleague. Maybe uh, we don't have these problems, but a certain uh, portion of our society uh, still is uh, surviving it. Uh, and hopefully, uh, fastly, we would be recovering it. I would like to be uh, very short because uh, there are a number of uh, speakers. So I would speak on the headlines. And uh, I, please, uh, I'm welcoming all your questions furthermore regarding the issue. Uh, so, and I would be very quick. Even though we have the short time uh, uh, limits, <laughs> I couldn't uh, surpass without announcing uh, some of our uh, pioneer women uh, of our society, which I would start by our first first lady, uh, who was a, a great contributor of her, of her time uh, for the improvement of the Turkish woman in the society. Then uh, the first parliament in 1935 elections uh, had 15 uh, women uh, members whereby Satı Çırpan was one of them uh, elected. And that's, uh, at the time, it was really, we were one of the first in having the woman's right. Then the writer, novelist, and all at the same time, uh, the, one of the first feminists of Turkey, Halide Edip Adıvar, who also during the war uh, really uh, personally uh, was helping, and she's, uh, played an important role in the Turkish woman emancipation. Uh, the first actress, uh, Muslim, also on stage uh, in 1920, Afife Jale, and also uh, the first female combat pilot of the world, as well as the Turkish female aviator, Sabiha Gökçen, whom the second airport of Istanbul is named after her name. So, um, I would be having uh, three parts uh, in my uh, presentation. The first one is what are the determining factors for women uh, uh, that 
the, how, what are the hindering factors for women and to be uh, in, the, uh, in the business uh, world? And then the second part is, uh, what can we do to improve uh, their situation? It has been clearly said that child care, and in most of the cases, elderly care is one of them, the family restrictions, social pro uh, pressure, and mistrust. Uh, as far as the education, uh, we see that as, as most women become more educated, uh, they are participating in the um, social life as well as the business life. And they, it continues further. When you look at this uh, graphic, uh, we can understand how education is so much important in women's uh, life to take part in the industrial uh, society. The second part is uh, there I would spend a few more minutes to explain because there sometimes statistics can be misleading or maybe at first glance you don't get the right uh, picture because there is a statistics that working women in Turkey and the percentage in the society is declining. Whereas with this graphic I would try to explain that actually the situation of the working woman in Turkey is improving. It's although it seems paradoxical, it's very, very basic and simple. Through urbanization, uh, there was a high percentage of unpaid women, which was uh, giving the percentage rate of the working woman in 1980s and even earlier. For instance, this figure was in 1950, 70%. Could we have said that the women were participating in the society for 70%? No. So uh, with the urbanization, when women started to move and started to work in the modern society, it became wage earners. And the number of women is rapidly increasing as the official working woman as wage earners. Therefore, maybe the percentage overall seems to be decreasing, but the quality of the work and the uh, quality of the life of the woman is increasing. This is what I call is the MR uh, of the woman. Uh, what happens when the woman is married uh, in the society? Uh, I would go very short given the time lapse because it might seem very complicated, but it isn't. Like we start with a single woman, then a woman getting married, first child, second child, third child. And in the case of this woman, if the woman is from the agricultural sector, if it's in the urban sector with a good wage and salary, or if it's in the urban sector with a normal salary, what happens to this woman's uh, life and how much she is in the business atmosphere? Uh, it, I would just uh, concentrate on the very last part of the, fa uh, of the scheme because there it says, the graphic says, that the agricultural woman is participating 55% around when she is 15 into the uh, work life. And when she is uh, really married with three kids, she's still on 57%. So with three kids, she's still working in the campaign, campaign in, and at workplace. But what's happening to the high-skilled woman if they have one and two kids, they are still surviving. But if they have three kids, then it drops to 20% as when they, as far as they can hold on their jobs or careers. So it seemed, so this tree actually is a, um, maybe you might have known or not, but our prime minister is constantly saying that each woman should have three child um, and at least three. So it seems that, uh, I would congratulate this 20% of the high-skilled women who can still carry on with uh, three kids and their careers. Uh, and unfortunately, for the low urban low uh, level, uh, they're hardly out of the uh, work atmosphere. So um, I'm questioning myself uh, this advice uh, as how far we can carry the improvement of the woman in the society. If we can, it's a great achievement, of course. So what, why is the female's participation is so important? It's all well been said by so many speakers that I would really try to be very short. 
um, of course, uh, it's a must. It's not an option for me and for the societies. It's a must because if the woman is in the labor force, it reduces the poverty. And also, it improves the economical and social welfare of the society. There's a one-to-one -one correlation, so women should be in the society and out of their house. Can we say that if we imagine hypothetically an atmosphere whereby woman is well-educated and woman is wealthy, so should they not work? Because for many, many cases, we put out this... Uh, that women should uh, work because for economical reasons they should work, or in, mo in other cases, uh, uh, you know, when their well-being, should they not work? But for my opinion, of course it's not enough that women, even if they are well-educated and they are wealthy, they should be participating into the society and they should be working and if by uh, definition democracy is against discrimin discrimination, you cannot claim that a democracy exists with half of the society working, the other half being, uh, being well, in this case, I would only cite uh, Atatürk. Uh, why is the female participation is important? It's in 1930, uh, it was said that human society is composed of two genders, male and female. Is it possible to improve the entire mass by improving only a single part of the mass and ignoring the other? Is it feasible for one half of an object to reach the skies while the other half is chained on the ground? So we are not changed on the ground, luckily, uh, maybe the um, happy minority, but of course we are responsible for the majority uh, for being in the sky, hand in hand together in the uh, contemporary Turkish society. So I would give you some positive figures. I'm very sorry for six minutes, two more minutes, uh, Mr. Well, Chairman. Well, it's not one minute, it's two minutes. Well, uh, uh, women are becoming much more educated and 30% of the lawyers, professors and doctors are women. I would like to answer the question because the question was raised in the early uh, session, because it's, uh, I think these are free professions. First of all, it's credible, a lawyer, professor, doctors, and then women have their time for their own in this profession, that they can hold their family, they can also uh, work, and they, have, they manage their time. So it's one of the uh, important factors why this is a high percentage. Um, According to the uh, 2010 Corporate Gender Gap Report, World Economical Forum, Turkey is, is one of the first three countries displaying the highest percentage female CEOs among OECD BRIC countries, and this is 12%. But uh, in this case, I would like to give you an example of TÜSİAD, which has two consecutive uh, women presidents from a uh, male's association, uh, from which uh, it's very... Uh, well seen that if also woman wants to, they would reach the unbroken uh, ceilings. Then um, there is there is a program uh, which is very recently started that is subsidizing uh, employer social security contributions for newly hired women for up to five years. So this is an encouragement for a uh, woman to start or an encouragement, also an incentive from an entrepreneurial point of view that uh, they are more tended to uh, employ women. That was the aim. There is also um, a decline in the agricultural employment, as I have said before, and urbanization increases number of women in the society, and they are getting married at a later age, so our fertility rates, despite our prime minister's wishes, is decline, declining at the moment. So, um, furthermore, uh, I think I stop at this moment by saying just one point. There is no gender equality body as required by EU Aki, so it should be established. Uh, so I think it should be mentioned in today's session. And I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to thank the World Bank Report and State Planning Organization, which they have made an excellent job in 
presenting the Turkish woman's position in today's society. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and, and an honor to be here, uh, having the opportunity to share with you the findings, some of the key findings of a study that was done by the European Training Foundation uh, at the end of last year. It was a study on human capital and employability, um, a cross-country review among the 14 uh, countries of the Union for the Mediterranean. These 14 countries which were included in the study are um, including Turkey, are Albania, Algeria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Montenegro, Morocco, Palestine, occupied Palestin Palestinian territory, Syria, Tunisia, and Turkey. Can you please? This is your image. Oops. This one. Yeah. No. Well, oops. Sorry. Okay. Well, in, I'm supposed to explain uh, all the findings in five minutes, uh, so I will be really very brief, but the publication has been distributed already. You must have it in your desk, so if you are interested in, you can read more. Um, well, these findings that I'm going to talk about is um, the basic findings uh, across the 14 countries. I prefer to start with the good news. Well, the first good news is education levels of females have increased and continue to be increasing in all countries. There is a huge improvement uh, during the last two, three decades in all the countries of the study as a result of, of the massification of the education system. Uh, so the, all the education systems in these countries have, uh, have been expanded. And we see this uh, also in the um, improving adult li literacy rates, for example. I have many graphs, but I, I'm not able to show all of, all of this to you. But as an example, you can see that um, we see adult literacy rates increased, gross enrollment rates in the primary education increased. Uh, almost 100% in all countries. Uh, gross enrollment rates in the secondary education and tertiary education has also increased. So young females are more likely um, to be uh, better educated than their mothers. There is an intergenerational difference, which is uh, good. Um, Another good news is female activity and employment rates, as has been already mentioned, um, increase with the level of education. There is a direct positive correlation in all countries, without any exception, that the higher the education level of females, more likely they, they are in the labor market. When it comes to the bad news, gender gap in education is not closed yet. Still, we see differences at all levels, from the adult literacy rates to the primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Unequal access to education is a problem, especially for girls, but especially girls with the poor and rural backgrounds. The second bad news uh, we can mention is the quality of education. This somehow has been compromised at the expense of expansion because the, because of the expansion of the education systems, there was a uh, decrease in the quality. And females are more likely to suffer from the good, bad quality education. There are much higher dropouts uh, among the girls. Um, they are not um, oriented by well-informed career guidance. And then there are also gender segregated, quite strongly segregated occupations at the intermediate level, especially in, within the uh, vocational and technical education and training system, which prevents girls to continue in their education. And finally, there is a very 
uh, well, non-negligible, let's say, number of young females who are neither in education nor in the labor market. I'm talking about those girls uh, aged between 14 to 24. And these are non-visible, actually, but they are there, and quite a lot. Um, when it comes to the employment, because we see education and training for employment, this is our mission also as a European Union agency specialized in the field of education and training. And the first good news is university education certainly increased the female employability in all countries without any exception. And they are mostly working as professionals, as already mentioned, doctors, lawyers, university professors, nurses, teachers. These are the most popular and generally um, preferred occupations or professions by females, but fewer managerial and political positions. The second good news is if we look at the working labor force, average qualification of working females um, is much higher compared to the males. Well, although their number is very small, but this tells something to us. And the third good news, you may take this as bad news as well, but um, there is no unemployment problem, a significant unemployment problem for the uneducated or primary educated females because they are rather inactive. Well, this is not good news maybe, but if we think of that they start to look for jobs, unemployment rates could really peak up uh, in, most, in all of the countries we studied, which are already unbearable levels. Uh, well, when we come to the bad news, female unemployment rate is always higher than the death of males. This is a consistent finding in all countries, and it increases directly with the level of education. So the higher the level of education, the more likely that females face the unemployment problem. Because, mainly because the low educated or uneducated are not active, um, not at all in the labor market. The second uh, bad news is the difference between the activity rates and um, activity rates of primary <coughs> and uh, secondary education. I want to show you this uh, graph because it shows, it shows that the difference between the activity rates of primary educated, which is the yellow one, and the secondary education, I mean upper secondary education, so in the, within um, lower secondary is included in the primary education in this graph, is very small. So the secondary education, upper secondary education, does not make any difference. This leads us questioning the value of the higher education. There is something wrong at that level. Uh, supposing that not every female cannot continue to the university education as like as every male, uh, this secondary level education needs much more attention for the labor market value of the education, for the employability. Um, and then finally, uh, labor market entry for females uh, is more difficult at the medium level qualifications, not at the highest level. Um, and this is mainly due to the low quality secondary education, but also very limited vocational choices for females, for girls. Um, because especially at the secondary level, vocational education and training field, um, there is a quite strong gender segregation by occupations and there are much more strong gender stereotypes. So this limits the choices of females at the secondary level. And there is an, also an issue of um, mismatch between the skills taught in the schools, but also at the labor market needs. So, I come to the conclusion, I have many graphs, but I can show you later if you are interested in. The first, maybe overall conclusion is massive female presence and success in education with shortcomings still. We know the shortcomings, but this is already very good news. However, their position in the labor market is, 
has been and still is weak. Uh, we see either inactivity or labor market dropout after, this, uh, after being discouraged uh, for some time looking for a job or high unemployment. Um, for that reason, we see also low and decreasing activity employment rates in all countries that we studied, and they are decreasing still. Actually, the average activity rate is around 50% uh, in, in most countries, and average employment rate is 40%. These are the total rates, mainly due to the very low female employment, and it's around 20 25% in the countries that I mentioned. This shows us, um, ETF thinks that this is a significant waste of human capital, female human capital with uh, long-term implications for the societies, for the development of the countries. And um, finally, again, this is also uh, the idea of, um, um, idea promoted by the ETF, we think that education and training and employment resulting with employment is one of the key factors for women empowerment if even we can say maybe precondition uh, and gender sensitive policies and affirmative public action is needed for having gender equity in these areas thank you very much for listening to me Thank you very much, Ms. Padak. So, ladies and gentlemen, we overviewed, uh, uh, we overviewed uh, the situation uh, in the largest uh, future EU member, Turkey, and also in the periphery of the European Union, uh, as far as the gender equality is concerned. So now maybe we can start to focus on the European Union, which is the most important superpower of standards in this part of the world. So let's see how the putting women rights at the core of the EU policies uh, is a challenge. Uh, so the floor is uh, for Ms. Uh, Cecilia Grebeval from European Women's Lobby. Thank you very much, um, dear members of the European Parliament and dear colleagues. And thank you very much to have invited us to present you some of the challenges that we've identified at this um, turning point. So I will be quick and not present everything because uh, so that we can have a discussion. Just a few words about the European Women's Lobby, just to say that we are a very large umbrella organization of women's organizations with member organizations in all the member states of the European Union and the candidate countries. So we also have a very active member organization in Turkey, and we're very happy to collaborate. Uh, and of course, our work is to do lobbying and to work with mainly the institutions of the European Union to promote women's rights and gender equality across all areas. So um, I just have a few examples of um, our activities. So this is the Thai demonstration that Mrs. Wallace was referring to because we were very active in our 50-50 uh, campaign on the elections to the European Parliament. So you can see um, the action where we went with ties and our CVs in front of the Council, which was uh, actually attracting a lot of press and media attention. It was great, except I find it a bit sad that we need to do these kind of things to uh, actually attract the attention and put more um, interest into our issues. But still, um, we'll continue to do this, and it's still very necessary. So this is another example of activities. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, crea of creating and helping the creation of a migrant women's network that will uh, then be able to input into European policies on immigration and asylum, for example. And just to give you another example, we've just uh, finished our Beijing plus 15 report. I have a few copies here, and this is a real um, gender mainstreaming exercise as we are looking into all the activities of the European Union and looking at what the EU has done uh, in relation to implementing the Beijing Platform for Action in health, in violence against women, poverty, the environment, etc. And reading this, you can see that there are challenges and areas where there's still a lot to be done. Um, but to go into the current challenges and the, the things that are happening right now, 
I have here a few figures that I won't repeat um, about the gender pay gap, about violence against women in the EU, and about women in decision making, which shows that more action is for sure needed. So in terms of the, the content and, and what we're try, trying to, to influence, we are at a turning point because we have a different um, institutional context, of course. We have the Treaty of Lisbon and a new um, a change in the power structure of the EU with more powers for the European Parliament and also new obligations in terms of gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming, the integration of a gender equality perspective in all areas has been strengthened by the Treaty of Lisbon, so including action um, in relation to external policies. So uh, we hope to see an implementation on this. And we also have a new Commissioner for Fundamental Rights and Citizenship, which also changes a bit the perspective in relation to women's rights, because this issue was previously dealt with in the framework of employment policies and putting it in a human rights framework could allow for broader action of the EU also in relation to violence against women, for example, but also other areas. So this is what um, we are hoping for. Now, uh, the other important development as, at the moment is that the political framework for gender equality at EU level is coming to an end. That was the European Roadmap for Equality between Women and Men, and the Commission is building a new one at the moment. So here we are hoping for a very visible and coherent strategy that would cover all areas. We hope that it will continue to promote both um, specific actions for women's rights, but also a very consistent and coordinated gender mainstreaming strategy. We also hope for a strong interse intersectional approach, which means taking into account the diversity and the diverse needs of women who are not an homogeneous group. What is also very important is coordination mechanism, because the roadmap should be an exercise in involving many services of the Commission, so this needs to be coordinated and this needs to have resources. And finally, um, we hope that there will be a link and some commitments by member states, so a relationship between the roadmap of the Commission and the member state level. So I'm, I'm maybe a bit too quick, but uh, <laughs> we have little time. But in terms of the European 2020 strategy, um, we, of course, very happy that there is a new strategy, but the issue here is that since Lisbon, since the, the year 2000, actually, the importance of um, gender equality in employment and conciliation measures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has been actually weakened. And what we see now is that the EU 2020 strategy, as Mrs. Wallace was saying, hardly mentioned women anywhere. So um, we really hope that gender equalities and issues related to, for example, the gender pay gap, but also the reaffirmation of the, the targets on childcare will be still uh, reintegrated into the EU 2020 strategy because there cannot be a long-term strategy to ensure growth and well-being without taking this into account. And so we really hope that there would be more uh, objectives in also objectives in relation to uh, equality between women and men. And I've mentioned the pay gap, which is still um, a scandal in Europe. So we very much hope, and we know that some countries and some um, actors support this. We hope that the, the Council of Ministers and uh, maybe even this house could um, work towards this. Um, in relation to the financial crisis, we've also done quite some work on this and we've just done also a study which is called um, Women's Poverty and Social Exclusion in the European Union at a Time of Recession and Invisible Crisis. And that shows really that um, recovery plans that have been adopted are really uh, mostly gender blind, that they don't take the situation of women into account and that 
it's a bit like business as usual. We continue with recovery plans that um, give subsidies to the traditional um, car manufacturer, etc., and that don't consider also the hidden costs of the crisis in terms of public services cuts, uh, b which have an impact on women's unpaid work, on women's economic independence, etc. Um, so we would hope that this crisis is uh, also used as an opportunity to make things a bit differently uh, in terms of the restructuring of the financial and economic architecture, in terms of the representation of women in economic decision making, in terms also of um, introducing gender budgeting at the European level, which hasn't happened yet. So there's a lot to be done in, really in, in, in trying to uh, work differently in, in our economic policies. So um, those are the other many, many different things that are currently happening at the European level and where uh, input is needed. So there is a new anti-discrimination directive that is being discussed. There is also a new maternity directive that is being discussed and uh, which is creating a lot of debates and a lot of discussions and where we are pushing for um, stronger provisions for all women in Europe. Um, then there is the issue of gender mainstreaming that uh, I've mentioned. On violence against women, we are making concrete proposals for finally the European Union to have strong policy on violence against women. It's an issue that has been really pushed by the Spanish presidency and we're delighted that something will, will happen, something in terms of policy and maybe even legislation might happen in the coming um, month, year, I don't know, on violence against women. Now, sitting in this house, uh, I can't help speaking about parity in the European institutions. Will there be quotas one day for the European Parliament, for the European Commission? We hope so, maybe for the next election. And of course, um, it's been shown that women are um, the workforce, part of the workforce that needs to be developed, that there are violations of, of women's rights in Europe, in the EU, and, uh, and beyond. And our message really is that women's rights are not a luxury for period of growth only, and that we need to continue working on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are direct questions to the, here to the Spanish uh, presidency and the European Commission. While leaving you to think about them a little bit, I will just uh, carry you on with uh, uh, some few questions from the floor that we received, first of all, uh, to not leave them unanswered. Um, uh, we received questions from uh, uh, Ms. Gwen Velici, Vizera Lekov, and Ms. Tumbash. Uh, one of them, uh, well, I will little bit summarize them, sorry uh, for not maybe addressing all of them, but. Uh, one question uh, is on uh, the current debate in some EU countries uh, uh, for the inter for, for against the use of uh, all kind of uh, cover burka or f uh, covering the face, uh, uh, all kind of dresses that uh, in, uh, uh, under which a woman is disguised, uh, and the current debate in Turkey on uh, uh, the full art as it is mentioned here, on the headscarf. So the question is, maybe to the Turkish speakers here, uh, to what extent this debate in Europe and the current debate in Turkey, uh, are they linked with the progress of uh, women's rights? Who wants to take this question? <laughs> <laughs> you do, Mr. Yeah. Chair. All right, go ahead, please. So it's a highly... Um, critical issue it might seem but uh, uh, I cannot uh, speak on behalf of the European countries decisions taken in that matter but uh, maybe I would speak on Turkey's behalf that first of all uh, the woman woman and I would really try to be specific not turning around the world that uh, women are covering their heads uh, for a long time uh, in Turkey and ever since uh, maybe in the agricultural sector. And when they moved into the big cities, this uh, habit also continued 
uh, in its existence. And lately, after 70s, late 70s and 80s, um, it became uh, a factor of a political uh, uh, movement. And there, maybe, uh, starts the differences of opinions. Uh, because as, as long as it is not a significant, it's not, impl impl how do you say, it's not impl implicating uh, a political um, um, attitude and a political standing position, it can go into the ground of uh, self-expression and also uh, free will or the way you want to um, dress yourself. But if it is a political issue and a sign of a political issue, then uh, it, it is uh, becoming a danger. Uh, this is why I would say um, my personal opinion, of course, is from the freedom side of the issue that women should dress in the way they want to dress, but um, should, women should not be the sign of the debates uh, of a political issue through uh, men's, uh, in, in, in that, how, do, how I would say? Maybe I couldn't uh, say it. Well, it's okay. You will help me, maybe? Well, uh, I think it's well clear. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I would like to give the floor right away to uh, Ms. Diaz. The main objectives of the Spanish presidency regard to equality. And the Spanish presidency um, uh, includes among its main aims the reinforcement of the EU values and the approach of a Europe of the citizens. I'm afraid that also my, my presentation it doesn't appear. It's, it's not a good day, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, just in case, if it's this one, well, it's a pity I have some beautiful pictures mainly to, to show, oh, maybe I just have my, um, yes, could be the last resource. A <laughs> uh, few minutes and technical problems. Um, well, uh, we uh, have been working uh, in mainly in mainstream gender violence and equal treatment. These are, this has been or are being our three main points. In relation to mainstreaming, we, our, we have been working with our colleagues of the trio about uh, trying that the uh, 2020 strategy includes 75% rate of employment, both for women and men, that initially the commission didn't da have that, uh, that uh, number. Uh, our aim also is the reduction of the gender gap uh, to 5%. This both, these both aims are an agreement of the trio. Uh, we, we are working also in measures re for reconciliation of family and per family, personal and working life. Uh, we all, uh, this list of things that I'm saying is what we are trying to push strongly to be included in the 2020 uh, strategy. Uh, a stronger support for women entrepreneurs, support for women in managerial positions, and a special attention to the evaluation of the roadmap for equality for the 2011-2015 roadmap. About gender violence, in the EBSCO Council of the age of March, of March we have some conclusions on gender violence. Uh, it has been passed the European Protection Order for the integral protection in any EU territories of any women uh, with um, uh, menace of uh, gender violence. It has been also agreed to establish a free toll EU telephone number 116016 for assistance and information in any of the 27 countries in the language, in any of the languages of the EU countries and also a proposal for one European observatory to coordinate, compile, and provide information on violence against women. 
it will be the main source of information for all those involved in the development of policy and public actions against women violence. We hope that the, the new um, Institute for Gender in Vilnius will be part of this observatory. In relation to equal treatment, uh, we are working, as has been said, in the directive proposal of the Council for no discrimination and equal treatment. That it goes parallel with uh, an, an, a bill that we are preparing in Spain. This is in the process of being discussed, probably could not be approved during this period, uh, but we hope that the Belgian presidency can go ahead with it. Uh, in relation with this equal treatment, uh, I have this here some pictures about the, mid, the second European summit for the Roma population that we have in last month in Cordoba. And at the same time, uh, uh, our minister uh, informed that the action plan in Spain for the development of the uh, Roma population. At the beginning of the presidency, in January, we have in Madrid the high-level group of mainstreaming that, that in which we try to put together our aims for the 2020 strategy and for the 2011-2015 uh, uh, roadmap that the Commission will present in September. Uh, an important key event of our presidency has been the second European Women in Power Summit. The first one was 1992 in Athens, and after that we will not have anyone until now, and we invited ministers, female ministers with any portfolio of any of the 27 governments to come to, uh, to, come to Cadiz and to discuss a declaration for empowering women in political power. Uh, at the end of the meeting of the summit, uh, the present ministers signed a CAD, the, what we are calling the Cadiz Declaration. I must say that was the, minister, uh, our, the Spanish Minister for Equality, Ms. Viviana Ido, plus Ms. Harriet Harman from the UK, the ones who have, uh, were leading this meeting. Uh, at the end of uh, March, we have in Valencia the informal meeting for European Equality Ministers. At the end of this meeting, we have a trio declaration of, on gender equality that uh, unified the aims of the three presidencies of the trio. And uh, it's a pity I cannot show you this picture because the family picture was uh, we gave every every single minister, and we gave them the red car that we are using, the red car to the violence. We are promoting this campaign of the show the red car to the violent. And, and all of them decided to use this red car and to, to show it in the picture. Uh, after we finish this informal meeting in Valencia, we have also the fifth women meeting, Women for a Better World. It's the meeting that we used to have Spanish and African women. We gathered together 500 powerful women, mainly from Africa, although a few of them from other parts of the world and from Spain. Uh, is the, as I said, is the fifth of a row that the Spanish prime uh, vice president is organizing. It started five years ago in Mozambique, and we, we hope it will continue. Uh, uh, on the same line, we have on the 13th to 14th of April, the Conference of Employment for Young People as a tool for social inclusion that is obviously comprehends uh, gender equality. And uh, the, remaining, the remaining key event of our presidency, a part of the June uh, Minister's uh, Council, will be an uh, experts meeting on equality and mass media on the 31st of this May in Madrid. This is all for my part. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the hurry. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, this uh, I, I would like to remind the audience that this event is online also uh, in the internet, and it will, there will be also a publication, and we will make sure that all your beautiful pictures will be uh, in that. Oh, yes. Uh, the, in, in the <laughs> web page of the ministry, is well. there are all pitch, pictures Perfect. and also the communications and papers delivered in all these events. Thank so, you very th much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. and uh, have a nice Sorry. flight. Back Madrid. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will also have a cocktail right after this to continue to talk uh, about all this also with the speakers. Uh, so you have some other questions. I suggest you to carry on this debate in the cocktail and I right away uh, give the floor uh, the, to, the, uh, to, Viv to Ms. Vivian Hoffman from the uh, cabinet of the Vice President of the European Commission, Ms. Uh, Vivian Redding. So Ms. Hoffman, please. Thank you very much. Dear members of the European Parliament, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today in the Tantis debate on behalf of Commissioner Vivian Reding and uh, to listen to most interesting presentations. Equality between women and men is a fundamental right. It is enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. Uh, it is enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the Union and it is underpinned by a very substantial acquis. Over the past decades, the EU has promoted equality between women and men through a dual approach of gender mainstreaming and specific action. Important progress was made. Now, can we rest on our laurels? Certainly not. There are still persistent gender inequalities on the labor market and in society. Women still face discrimination. They are underrepresented in decision-making positions, educational stereotypes, segregation on the labor market, and women's predominance in precarious employment are still widespread realities. On the 5th of March, the European Commission adopted the Women's Charter. This charter represents the political commitment of each member of the European Commission, as well as of the college as a whole, to improve equality between women and men in all policies. The Charter identifies five areas of action. One of them is the promotion of gender equality beyond the Union in our relations with third countries. But let me just briefly uh, mention the, the five areas. Um, equal economic independence, equal pay for equal work, and work of equal value. Equality in decision-making, dignity, integrity, and putting an end to gender-based violence. Gender equality beyond the union, as I, as I said earlier. And those will be translated into a new strategy for equality between women and men, which Ms. Uh, Vivian Redding plans to present after the summer break. We are also planning to put forward a policy framework to tackle violence against women, including female genital mutilation. Up to 25% of women in Europe have experienced violence, physical violence, at least once during their adult lives, and 10% have suffered sexual violence. Another priority um, is the work with member states to significantly reduce the gender pay gap it is unacceptable that there is still an 18% average gender uh, pay gap across the EU, and this is actually widening in some countries. Um, and therefore, we launched the second phase of the gender pay gap campaign in the beginning of March this year. Um, now, uh, mentioning the uh, gender perspective in the Europe 2020 strategy, um, Gender equality plays an important role in the strategy, uh, which was presented by the Commission in March. The strategy aims to foster a smart, sustainable, and inclusive economy, which delivers high levels of employment, productivity, and social cohesion. And we need, therefore, to ensure that women and gender equality fully contribute to and benefit from the strategy. For instance, uh, looking at smart growth, we know that 60% of new university graduates are women, uh, but their potential in the labor market is still underutilized. And we would therefore need to encourage women to engage more in engineering or mathematics, to participate more in innovation, research and development activities, as well as in the digital economy. 
Inclusive growth means achieving high employment economy, which delivers economic, social, and territorial cohesion. And um, in the context of Europe 2020, the Commission underlines that policies to promote gender equality will be needed to increase labor force participation, thus adding to growth and social cohesion. Now, um, let me also please uh, say a couple of, of words about Turkey. Um, the Commission follows developments in, in gender equality um, in Turkey with great care. Um, the last progress report highlighted um, that Turkey has made progress in this field. Um, in March 2009, a parliamentary committee on equal opportunities for uh, men and women was established, which will be able to screen draft legislation. This is um, a step in the right direction. But it is clear that there is still considerable work to do uh, to give uh, women the same opportunities as, as men in, uh, as was said earlier, economy, politics, and education. And uh, we warmly encourage Turkey to ensure the full implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the National Action Plan for Gender Equality 2008-2013. Overall, gender equality remains a, a major challenge, both in terms of legal alignment with the acquis and in terms uh, of the persistent gap between men and women in economic participation, political representation, and access to, to education. And uh, I, must, I must say that I was very much impressed um, about what um, our first speaker uh, explained about it, that he sent me to, to school campaign, which um, seems to be an extremely efficient one. And indeed, more needs to be done to improve women's access to education in particular by ensuring that girls continue to the next educational stage and by identifying and supporting school dropouts. Another area that cannot be ignored is violence against women, which is still widespread in, in certain areas. Um, so um, the efforts to prevent the so-called honor killings and, and domestic violence needs to be intensified by making women fully aware of their rights and by increasing the number of shelters for female victims of domestic violence. Um, we would indeed encourage Turkey uh, to introduce an independent gender equality body, as was mentioned earlier, in order to push forward greater legal alignment with the, with the EU acquis. Um, now, Turkish NGOs, professional organizations, and social partners can play a pivotal role to empower women, women. Um, and um, indeed we highly welcome uh, Kadikia's proactive uh, role on promoting gender equality. Um, and also very much welcome the, uh, the support of TUSIAD in promoting equality between men and women in the private sector. Um, and by having a represent representation in, in Brussels, um, both of you can facilitate uh, keeping gender equality issues of Turkey on the EU agenda as, as we see today. Um, I would also um, like to, to add very briefly that the Commission continues to support Turkey's efforts to improve gender equality through financial support. Um, promoting gender equality is a specific objective of our pre-accession funding. And overall, uh, the support for gender equality and women's rights in Turkey has so far amounted to over 80 million uh, euro. And this had, has led to useful projects on a wide range of, of issues. Um, now, um, getting back very briefly uh, to um, the, the, our general context, um, I would say that uh, the economic and financial crisis has affected both men and, and women, but in different ways. While male-dominated sectors have been strongly hit by the recession with significant job cuts, uh, the risks of cuts in bu public budgets um, is likely to have a serious impact on, on women as well. And um, now maybe on... Um, uh, on, on, on a more uh, general um, issue as, as well, I would say, um, we have come a long way, and it is clear that we still have a long way to go. Um, gender equality is a precondition for sustainable growth, for employment and competitiveness and social cohesion. 
we, we must ensure that our future labor market and society um, are based on the fundamental principle of equality between all citizens, irrespective of gender. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hoffman. So uh, now uh, Ms. Meissner will uh, conclude uh, this session. Please, Ms. Meissner. Okay, now the time is running. Well, we are running out of time, and I have now the honor to, to make the conclusions. I have a few minutes, I think. Uh, well, what just uh, Mrs. Hoffman said, it was already kind of a conclusion. That's at least what I think. She uh, didn't uh, let uh, pass review everything we just heard about, but uh, she uh, finalized what has to be done still for gender equality in general in Europe and especially maybe in Turkey. But before I come to my conclusions, I would like to briefly say something to all the speakers who had been here, because I really want to thank all the speakers, of course, who joined our, um, our panel. It was really very, very interesting. And well, it's never enough time if it's interesting what we are going to hear, what we are hearing by the speakers. So first of all, um, I just make it really brief so that we come to an end after a while. Uh, Mr. Sava from Suziat at the beginning, he said that women play more and more an important role in, the tur in Turkey. I think that's really true. And of course, there has still much to be done, but uh, it's, it's a progress we can uh, see and that's, uh, yeah, make us ma ma that makes us hopeful, so to say. And uh, Mrs. Sevant, I hope I pronounced the names in the right word. I don't know quite, <laughs> I don't know whether I really do. Um, she uh, was talking about uh, women who have been very long time victims in several ways, and that is, it's, it's necessary to fight in courting gender equality against violence against women. And then what impressed me very much in uh, your report was uh, what you did with Kagidar uh, uh, in this employment campaign with the photos. I think it was really quite interesting and as far as I remember, my dear colleague Diana Wallace, she already mentioned it could be used in all the countries of Europe. <laughs> That's really true, not only in Turkey. Then Mrs. Harrington uh, Bogai, is it right? No. Pronunciation of, na of names is a little bit different. She mentioned the economic growth uh, that depends on high percentage of good qualified women, and that's really uh, something that came like a red thread, so to say, to several speakers' amendments and and um, presentations. And uh, so, yeah, you're we're talking about uh, violence against women again. So that was another topic that really was mentioned and. By, by many speakers today. Um, that leads me to Mr. Maseka from the European Commission. He presented, presented this Daphne program and uh, well, he showed that it's really very important to do something in projects fighting violence against women and we found out that's never enough uh, money in the pot, so to say, to really finance everything we should be able to finance according to come to a better solution than we have right now. Uh, then uh, Mrs. Morgan from Kagida, uh, she mentioned the importance of education. Education as a main issue to really have access to everything, access to employment, access to social life and political life and everything. And it was another campaign presented that really impressed me as well uh, very much, this Daddy Sent Me to School campaign. And uh, something that uh, impressed me especially, it was uh, the last photo, the last short video sh you showed. Uh, in this video, you, I think you remember, there were several girls just showing up, I want to go to school, so to say, that's uh, what was uh, the message. And one girl didn't say anything, she was married at very young age, and that's still a problem, especially Turkey has, and we have to face this and to, tr to try to find a solution for this. And you know, I come from Germany, and even in Germany, that's really a problem we always try to, to, to fight against, that uh, Young girls are against their will married uh, in a forced marriage and then lose the possibility to have contact and access to several things they maybe dream of for, uh, for their life. Now, um, Nurger, my neighbor from Tuziet, uh, she was um, 
talking about Erdogan. I just always pick something out. Erdogan who calls for women to produce more children. <laughs> it's kind of the way you, you expressed it. And that you mentioned quite clear that especially for a good qualified, a qualified woman, uh, they come down to a low percentage under 20% of employment if they really have more than three or three children. Um, well, that's a problem for several countries in Europe right nowadays, but especially for Turkey, it's really problematic. And so uh, you shouldn't follow his, his, his advice, although I like children a lot, but uh, if you see that it really uh, attacks women and hinders women from access to everything they want to have access to, then it's not a good advice Ms. Mr. Erdogan uh, did for women in Turkey. Um, yeah, Mrs. Bardak, she was mentioning the gender gap in education. That's not closed yet in some countries. That's true in several countries, even of member states. Uh, the gender gap in education is not really closed. We have in uh, old member states uh, quite well-educated women, but uh, still in poor families, uh, the girls have less uh, education than the boys, and so still here we have a gap we have to close. And uh, well, afterwards you mentioned that the average qualification of uh, working women is quite often higher than that of male working um, persons. That's right, but uh, the access to high positions, uh, it's not the same. It doesn't, it's not the equivalent to this, and so we always have to work for this. Uh, Mrs. Grebova, she produced, uh, no, she showed us from Beijing to Brussels. So uh, you showed up, you, you mentioned that still a lot uh, of things had to be done for women in especially. And what I liked uh, um, in your um, presentation is that you mentioned diversity, because I think the diversity approach is a very good one, not only for gender equality between men and women, but as well for uh, other parts of society who are uh, who, who suffer under um, discrimination and so if we really take this diversity approach it would be good for everybody in society in general and you were asking for something that should be included in the EU 2020 strategy according gender equality and then there was Mrs. Diaz who showed quite uh, <laughs> clear that the trio working on 2020 strategy and the presidency uh, really uh, implemented several um, asking, several very diff difficult or no, no, um, important issues in this agenda like 75% uh, of employment for men and women, for both of them, and the pay gap that should be closed and everything. And finally, yeah, Mrs. Hoffman, I already mentioned before that you made kind of a conclusion already before I was asked to do this because you said we cannot uh, rest on our laws, although we reached a lot in several parts uh, of, of, of Europe, uh, it's still a long way to do. And uh, you mentioned a new strategy for equality between uh, women and women that shall be pre presented after the summer break. And now I, well, I, I kind of try to make a, a quick ride through all the speakers and uh, to just remember what was said before. And my conclusion to the question we asked at the beginning, do we need a new framework for gender equality by 2020 on both sides of Europe, East and West, and I include and Turkey? Then I would say, yes, we really need this. We are on the best way to have a new framework. And uh, well, because we were talking about the EU, enlargement as well, and that's of course a question that's in the background the whole time while we are sitting here. Um, Turkey is longing for an access to the European Union, and uh, while the negotiations end already quite a long time, and no end is to be seen up to now. My colleague Diana Wallace mentioned that the liberals are quite, off, uh, quite, quite open for this excess and that we had a special re resolution in Barcelona. I had been in Barcelona as well. But uh, at the end, I want to mention that really I would be happy to have Turkey and the European Union, but especially according gender equality, there has to be several things
to be done. You all know this, we all know this. And I hope very much that uh, yeah, the fight against violence against women and uh, the excess women uh, is not given in Turkey in several ways. Um, and uh, yeah, the enforcement to marriages, marriage, for example, uh, women don't want, young girls don't want that. All this can be solved if we work together in a good, yeah, partnership. I'm looking forward to this, and I, for myself, will um, help if I can and do several things <laughs> according to help you. And I really hope that all our wishes we have for a partnership in future will come true. And again, I thank everybody to, that you came here, that you joined our um, uh, meeting. And well, now I forget you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I, of course, I uh, thank Mr. Kalia Gassi, is it right? Yeah? That he made such a good moderation, that he was a chair in our last panel, and that he really made it almost to finish at seven o'clock. It's, it's a little bit later right now, but it's kind of a wonder that we almost came to an end uh, at the exact point we wanted to have. So thank you for every, I thank everybody to, yeah, that you have been here and you know that just now, one floor upstairs, there's a cocktail waiting for you. And I would like very much if you would join us with a cocktail and have some talks to us and maybe then all the questions you couldn't raise before, you can then ask to the, our speakers while you have your cocktail. Thank you very much for coming and bye-bye.